Hi, hello and welcome to another video. My name is Fernando Munoz Bernal, hence the name Fair Move, and today I'm joined by Jerry Gray, Jerry's take on China. Jerry, how are you today? I'm great, thank you. Coming to you from the wonderful ancient city of Luoyang in Henan province. Luoyang. It's a former, former capital of China. Hmm. <laughs> I'm coming at you from Hetan, a very key place in what we are going to talk about here, which is Adrian mm -hmm. Sense's latest article uh, about cotton picking in Xinjiang and how it's all bad, 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 bad. So yes. um, what are we going to do today? Today we're going to go through, well, you read the article, I read the article, and we picked up some of the things that we don't really understand how this is presented in a negative light. So that, that's what we're going to do. We're going to show you actual uh, screenshots of the article and we're going to discuss some of the things that we find there. Um, before we start, Jerry, is there anything that you would like to to share or, or comment on this today's video? Before we start, <clears throat> I'd like to go to the conclusion. There's one point in the conclusion sure. that I'd like to make and that is that the, the art, the, well, let's call it a paper. It's a published paper. The paper is written by Adrian Zenz and it's peer reviewed and it's, it's in, in a University of California um, uh, publication. So one would expect that it has some sort of credibility. In the conclusion, uh, one of the most important things that we can point out is that Adrian Zenz quite clearly says they either do this or they did this. In other words, he has no evidence throughout the paper that it's still happening. What he suggests is happening, which we can dispute anyway, but even what he suggests is happening, in his conclusion, he says, we think it happened or it's happening, but we don't know. His conclusion <laughs> uses past tense to say they deployed people, but they might deploy people. Uh, they rely on information. They might have relied on information. So in other words, uh, if we can just have that in our minds, this is the conclusion, have that in our minds as we talk through the rest of the paper, I think that's probably important. Yeah, definitely. Um, but we're going to start from, from the beginning, okay? Course, so we're going to start from the, from the abstract, yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. Let me go back to the top, and then we, we present it to you guys. <clears throat> So the extra begins with, um, well, what the study does is trying to trace the state sponsor, what he calls coercive labor in the cotton um, harvest in China. Um, so right here, it says um, the article finds that the resulting labor are not easily captured through um, the standard measures of ILO. So this is something that we're going to talk about quite a bit here. Um, he is, for all intents and purposes, trying to redefine where an ILO violation is. <clears throat> he states that ILO is not designed to um, provide a framework for government forced labor. And you had a take on, on, on this, Jerry. What, what was your opinion on that? Yeah, um, ILO doesn't really talk very much about state-sponsored forced labor or state-sponsored coercive labor. And the reason for that is because basically it's a, it's a subsidiary of the United Nations Human Rights, uh, uh, Human Right HRC, Human Rights Council. And what happens there is that the United States will not put this information into international law. They will not put it into any form of paperwork. It's a little like UNCLOS, they, which they won't sign, because if they were to sign the uh, the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea or the, uh, <laughs> the the labor organization paperwork, then what they will be doing is putting themselves in the into the position of the prime violators of these particular pieces of legislation or international standards that that apply. And of course, th they can't have that. They would be they would be breaking their own laws if they put it into law. So that's mm -hmm. one thing. So to it's remember. important to remember. It's important mm. to remember why ILOs don't actually apply to government. But let's continue because you're going to see a lot of the, the <clears throat> things that don't really make sense. He says Xinjiang labor transfer programs pursue economic aims. So they're trying to improve the economy of the region. They're trying to improve the livelihood of He doesn't provide any. Mm -hmm. 
in the ethnopolitical goals in Xinjiang. Um, that's 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 where we start. We start with him saying, "This is about poverty alleviation," but don't believe that poverty alleviation is good. It's just because they want to. Um, get what they want. Their goals are to uh, integrate uh, the minorities into the Han majority and all their all those uh, negative things that he likes to say. Uh, <clears throat> he struggles to to bring definitions from different papers and different people that will allow him to paint this poverty alleviation programs in a negative light. He takes, for example, um, and I'm going uh, through the article page by page. There's only one place where I skip, okay? Um, in this part, he says, well, a for uh, forced labor could be defined, this is somebody else, this is not him, right? As the absence of freedom to actively decide for or against taking part in the cotton industry. This is what somebody else defined as a structurally forced consent. Um, mm. And again, he goes on to say that ILO is not enough. Yeah, um, ILO overlooks <clears throat> coercion may be constituted through a variety uh, or a continuum of forms of degrees on, on freedom. That's it's one also, of the... Um, it's yeah. worth noting that Maguire and Lasser, who wrote this paper, wrote this paper <laughs> about... Not Xinjiang, but Uzbekistan. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. Kazakhstan. One of the yep. stands, Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan, I think. And and he, the, it was written. It was written about the former Soviet method of coercive labor, rather than anything that China has ever done. It didn't. Mean, the paper doesn't talk about China. It talks about the uh, the the Asian uh, Eurasian countries that were doing this. So, continue. so he's basically using whatever he can to criticize <clears throat> ILO as not enough. Uh, yeah. He uses here Hickey and de Toit, uh, and the concept of adverse incorporation. And this is in a different color because I'm going to come back to this uh, because he contradicts some of the things that he's trying to push. He says adverse incorporation uh, is about the, exploiting the vulnerabilities and short-term needs of the poor people uh, to create exploitative labor relations. Um, they meet the immediate material needs of the people, but perpetuates structural poverty. Uh, poverty, sorry. Um, so it's presented as a choice, but um, it's, it's a choice that is made in the context of on freedoms. We're going to talk about that a little bit later when we talk about the mechanization of cotton picking in the region. Um, what would you elaborate on, on this particular take? Well, <clears throat> in terms of who he's citing, I've got I've actually got some notes here for citations. OK, so mm -hmm. let, let's look at who he's citing and how he's interpreting those citations. There are 17 citations of Chinese government, either central government. And he actually cites the CPC. There are regional government where he cites the Xinjiang uh, Uyghur Autonomous Regions uh, government. And there are embassies around the world that he's cited where they have made a comment about what is happening in China. Now, of course, none of those would say we are coercing and forcing people to do anything in Xinjiang. None of them would say that. None of them did say that. And his interpretation of everything that they that he cited, 17 different Chinese citations, he's basically said, this is what they're saying. But of course, that's not true because it wouldn't be true, because I don't think it is true. And therefore, he's ignoring anything positive that's coming out of this. He has um, uh, 13 quotes from Chinese media, and again, Chinese media. Now, one thing I'd like to say about Chinese media, many people who follow me have heard me say <clears throat> this before. They don't tell lies. They never tell lies. If they don't want you to hear something, they just don't print it. They don't publish it. So you don't get to hear Chinese media telling a lie, saying that's not happening when something is happening. If something is happening, they'll just ignore it. That's my view on Chinese media. I cannot catch them in a lie. So he cited Chinese media 13 times, and he's done the same thing there. He's interpreted what they say as either being false or misleading on the basis of previous work that he's done. Now, he then goes on in this, in this paper he cites himself, it's a 25-page paper, he cites himself 
39 times, using 13 of his own papers as sources of information. So I don't know how we get circular referencing away from anything like that. Now, had it been that his previous papers had been peer-reviewed and had been established as true, then we'd have something to, to, to discuss and to disagree with. But we don't. At no stage has anybody who has been to Xinjiang ever said what Adrian Zen says is true. No one who has been there says this. Only people who have not been there. Now, there is one person, one person only that I've come across, and his name is Darren Byler. Darren Byler is cited in this, and he did live in Xinjiang, and he did live among the Uyghur community, and apparently he speaks the Uyghur language and he speaks Chinese quite well. <clears throat> now, he was helping Uyghur dissidents. Now, the interesting thing about Darren Byler is that he lived among Uyghurs, helping Uyghur dissidents, and he's now in Canada working in a university. If he was anything that the Chinese government were afraid of, if he was any kind of spy, he wouldn't be he wouldn't have been allowed to leave. If he had evidence that something was happening, surely this authoritarian state would have prevented him from leaving and found some trumped up charge to have, to have held him on. So I, I, I question the veracity of pretty much everything. When he's citing 13 Chinese media, 17 Chinese government or, or government uh, organizations from within the government, and then he's citing people like James Liebold of ASPI, and Darren Byler, mm. who is notoriously anti-China, he's been described by Global Times uh, as a fabricator who works for the American government, uh, which, of course, he denies. Now, the other thing is, I've, I'll just reiterate that one point. I've never found Chinese media to tell a lie. If they don't want us to know something, it's not in the media. Simple as that. They won't say it. So I want to elaborate on, on, on something Go that on. you mentioned here is that he self-references himself so much to try and build that, that narrative of, yeah, this is, this is something that we have proved. So let's take a look at what he says here in his research method. He says, this article builds on the earliest study demonstrating forced labor in Xinjiang cotton harvest. Demonstrating. Now, I want you to watch this very short clip. This is something that we did, you and I, together with yeah. Brian. Uh, it's a minute long, but pay attention to what he describes as demonstrating. Primary source that they're all going to, even though they themselves have no primary sources in their reports, about this supposed coerced or slave labor regarding pretty much everything in relation to Xinjiang. But in, in particular, we're talking about cotton. So this was Adrian Zen's report from 2020, course of labor in Xinjiang, labor transfer and the mobilization of ethnic minorities to pick cotton. And uh, to make a long, long report very short, just go to the conclusions because he, he summarizes everything that's in this report in the conclusion. And you will see things that say a, a factor that increases concerns about coercion, right? Uh, you will see that this, this kind of language throughout the entire thing, concerns, risk of coercion. Uh, and then right down here, it is impossible to define where coercion ends and where local consent may begin. What does that mean? That means he, he doesn't know what he doesn't is know being anything. done. Yeah, he doesn't yeah, know well, anything, then. really. He doesn't. He so, still doesn't. Guys, <laughs> he still doesn't. Uh, it, it happened or it didn't happen. We're not sure. But important that now he is building up on that work that he did in 2020 and now he calls that a demonstration he has demonstrated mm. forced labor in Xinjiang cotton harvest uh, uh, somebody needs to call him out on that because well, we have in 2020, yeah, we have called him out the, there is one way out. to find out if, if he yeah. had the ability to, to do so there is one way to find out and that is field studies now in order to study anything academically at a peer reviewed level and the University of California should not be publishing stuff that is based on, I mean, University of California won't publish me when I write an article about America because I've never been there. And I do write articles about America and how terrible their policies are. I do that quite often. 
but they won't publish me because I haven't done any field research. I haven't been there and asked people on the ground. So why do Cambridge University gave him a PhD on the basis of his research into the Tibetan plateau, which and the, and the sinicization of it, which he never visited. They've given him uh, credence and credibility on the basis of information that he says is happening. Now, there's one other point which probably everybody who watches this already knows, and that is Adrian Zenz is on a mission from God to destroy the Communist Party. That oh, yeah. hardly allows for an unbiased opinion. When he reads something positive about China, he immediately dismisses it as either a lie, false propaganda, misrepresentation, or he doesn't even bother to read it. He just goes for the negative stuff. So he's reading people like James Leobold, like Darren Byler, like himself, who have interpretations that are very different. The only way to find out if what he says is true is to do what you're doing and what I'm doing or have done, and that is to travel through Xinjiang and talk to people. And you're doing it right now, and I've done it. And both of us have a different opinion to him. Um, I think that what I want to do right now is go to the, the next thing that I highlighted, sure. uh, which is a lack of understanding, uh, as you've mentioned it before, of China as a country, uh, the culture of China, the the history of his, his governance. Um, it's He starts by defining, okay, there's two ways to talk about um, forced labor. One is uh, detainees, which he doesn't go too much into. We, we'll talk about that, what he says about that. They're more about what to do after the cotton has been picked. So basically, these are people who... Um, are, have learned skills during the vocational training, right? So they learn how to make clothes, they learn how to make shoes, they learn how to use the cotton to make things, and then they find employment in factories that actually make garments. So some of yeah. these companies that want to be, that um, the United States and the Senate and politicians want to ban right now with this committee on the CPC, uh, like Adidas, Nike, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They employ people who went through vocational uh, training, learning the skills, mm -hmm. and now have jobs making these um, these apparel and these shoes and whatnot. So that's, that's what he calls detainees, people who were given skills in order to find them jobs and in order to not keep them idle. Because we're going to talk about the lazy people in a minute. Now, the <laughs> second uh, kind of uh, forced labor that he talks about is the one related to poverty alleviation. So let's yep. talk about this and, and, and point out his lack of knowledge about China. He says, well, we, we're looking at B, okay, which is poverty alleviation through labor transfer. Um, a program that exists in a broadly similar but typically much less coercive form in many Chinese regions. First of all, Typically, much less coercive. Any evidence? Any proof? Uh, does he no, provide any, any kind of support for what he's saying here? No. But this is a very important part. You've got to ask yourselves, how has China developed uh, into, into probably the largest economy in the world since 1979, yeah. the reform and opening up? They had a project to basically develop certain areas of the country, mainly coastal areas, Shanghai, mm. Xinhai, uh, sorry, uh, Qingdao, uh, Guangdong, yeah, yeah. Where, where you and I where lived live. for so many years. I lived in Guangdong for 23 years. And what do we find in these areas? That the local people are a very small minority. But most mm. of the people who live there and have lived there for decades came from other places, yep. from skilled talent, people with education, people with good knowledge, people with uh, lots of studies, but at mm -hmm. the same time, just plain and simple factory workers. Yeah, people yeah if, you leave school in, if you leave school in uh, Sichuan or Hunan and you have no qualifications, and a lot of people do, uh, currently 60% of Chinese people go on to tertiary education, which could be vocational training, but 40% don't. What do they do? They can get a job in a local shop, in a local restaurant, or they work in the family business, in, in whatever it is they're doing, retail or service businesses. But many of them will spend two, three, ten, sometimes 20 years 
in Guangdong or in uh, Xiamen or Fuzhou or one of the <laughs> bigger cities where Ningbo, where, where, there are, where there are massive opportunities. Right now, every single factory in, in Guangdong has a sign outside the board telling you how much you can earn if you live here. And when you live here, if you're coming from outside of town, where do you live? You can't afford to go and rent a place in Shenzhen. So they put you in a dormitory and it's free and they give you food and it's subsidized. So you're paying a couple of dollars for uh, three square meals a day and, and it, you get free accommodation. Mind you, that accommodation does have a steel door and bars on the windows and a lock on that door. So people assume that it's a prison cell. People who don't know, it also has a security gate on the front of the factory. And quite often it's managed by a department of the police. So it's painted blue and white. Why Why is there a lock? Why are there steel bars? To protect the things that belong to the people who came from other provinces. Those are their belongings. I thought thought it was to stop their freedom of movement, Fernando. (laughs) Was I wrong? You were. I've been advising Adrian (laughs) Zenz incorrectly all this time. No. So here's here's the thing that... uh, you need to remember about this. This labor transfer has been going on in China for decades, and it has never been a problem for any of the capitalists or politicians or governments that are now attacking Xinjiang. So you got to stop and question yourself, why is it problematic when it happens in Xinjiang now? as opposed to when it happened in Guangdong or when it happened in, in, in other parts of China that has made billions and billions of dollars for the uh, American economy, for American corporations, for individual traders, you know, mm-hmm. th- those people who come to China and, and they just put a brand on something and then they ship it and they make millions. Just individual capitalists, individual guys who come here to do some trade and manufacture on their own. We're not talking necessarily big brands. These are millions of Westerners who have become millionaires. Yep. By you. The Canton Fair is full of them every year, twice a year. Of manufacturing that relies on, well, bringing people from other places to this nodes of production uh it's that's what happened so you've got to ask yourselves if it was okay in guangdong why is it bad now in xinjiang especially when xinjiang was left behind in terms of poverty and that is a fact the first time i went there was probably i think it was 2005 or 2006 it was very poor desperately poor area and even places like the Da Bazaar, the big uh, bazaar area, the marketplace, which everybody who goes to Urumuchi would know. And if anybody's seen pictures of Urumuchi, you'll see this Da Bazaar. It's a, there's a huge minaret tower in the middle of it. And it's a great place to go and see and feel and embrace the, the local culture without getting out into the countryside and, and actually experiencing it, uh, the real culture. It's kind of a little bit fake and touristy, and there's no doubt about that. But you, know, you can go to these places and you can see these people and you can talk to them and interact with them. And if this is a fake, if this is a Potemkin village, this is the world's largest fake. The whole of Xinjiang apparently is being faked into saying there's something they're not. I can't imagine that that's true. It's just impossible to be true. Adrian since mentioned some of the places that I have been to. One of them was yeah. Yeshan. Yes, and I think is is pronounced, and uh, and other places around around um, Kashgar. Mm-hmm. These are places that I can put video here, and you are you're watching right now. Um, what I see, modern, new, great roads, great infrastructure. They are putting so much money into this area to develop, to to bring it up to. Um, standards of living that are similar in other parts of the country and, and do remember the vast the vast dimensions of Xinjiang so to do this yeah, yeah. It's, it's a huge endeavor and one thing that I would like to mention is how important is sisterhood or or all the regions of China supporting these areas everywhere we go we yeah. think well Shenzhen donated our electric buses or or Zhengzhou built this hospital or it, it's it's an an attempt to integrate Xinjiang with the support of the rest of China. So yes. 
we we need to actually show people that poverty alleviation is not is not a gimmick it's a real thing that takes place mm -hmm. it's a real thing that benefits people and and that in and why why are they doing this and i've said well, the this critics, before the critics the of all of these china systems goes through xinjiang the future of yeah. china goes through xinjiang Yes, Jerry. Yeah, because it, it, you can get trains across the region as well, and it borders with Afghanistan. A lot of Americans don't know that Xinjiang has a border with Afghanistan, which is part of the original problem. Uh, but the critics of this system, where, where they pull down these slums and they build high-rise buildings, the critics come along and say, they've destroyed the society. But they haven't destroyed the society. They've destroyed the part of society that was creating unhealthy living conditions, contributing to the low birth rate, or they had, they had a high birth rate, but a very, very high mortality rate. So they had high infant, infant mortality. They had all of the things that happen in third world countries that were negative. And the only thing they do and did have, and they still do have, is their culture. And that is being retained. And you've seen that now uh, because you're there. I know that the first time you and I spoke, you, you, you hadn't actually been through Xinjiang at that time. And you were looking forward mm. to the first time. And I remember you said that you got turned away because you thought there was a security issue. And I said, no, it's probably about your electric vehicle. They wouldn't <laughs> let you in because they didn't have the facilities for you. You'd, you'd get 200 kilometers into Xinjiang and then find that there is not a there's not a recharging point. And, and you end up being stranded and you become, you become a problem for them because now they yeah. have to come and rescue you and your car and your family. and your, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, it makes so a lot just of sense. Just for the purposes of, of the people who are watching now who don't know what you're doing, you should explain what it is that you and your wife and your dog and two cats are currently doing. <laughs> My dog and two cats, they sleep all day. But me and my wife, basically, we're traveling around Xinjiang. Well, we're traveling around all of China. We just did three months in Yunnan. Well, we are on our second year. So this year we did three months in Yunnan. Then we just ran through Sichuan because we wanted to get to uh, Xinjiang as early as possible because the temperatures are, are really high over here during the summer. So we're doing the first, the southern part of Xinjiang. So we entered through Hami and we've gone to Aksu, we've gone to many other places in between, small places that nobody has ever heard of. Uh, and we ended up in Kashgar. And now we're going our, along the border with Tibet uh, into other smaller cities. Uh, and right now in, in Hetian or Hotan, whatever way you want to you want to pronounce it. And um, we are proceeding in a few days to go back to um, Aksu. And from there, Urumqi and start doing the Northern Loop. It's, it's a third the size of Europe. It's huge. Mm. So we have allocated yeah. three months to doing this trip. Um, I would like to mention uh, one thing about what people normally see and what Chinese state media likes to show um they like to show the the best of xinjiang and the best of xinjiang can be seen in these touristy, touristy places where they have the performances and where they have the singing and where that everything is neat and, and organized and, and perfect and nobody would do anything else um, <laughs> the the, the music, municipality of los angeles wouldn't go to uh, the streets where the, the homeless live to try and promote Los Angeles, right? They would just no, go to the nicest right. places. So don't criticize state media for doing what they do. However, what I am showing you is those cities where they don't go. And what you see is the the, 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 the bustle, the hustle, the, the, the everyday activity and, and the freedom that they have, the expression of the culture that they have. There's places where we are like, oh my God, God, we can't communicate because they don't speak Mandarin. They don't mm. speak Mandarin. Mm. So it's the little kid who's learning Mandarin at school cool. and English. And by the turn of uh, his adulthood, he's going to be much more prepared than any American because he speaks three languages. So they are the ones translating for us. <laughs> so yeah. we went to buy a, a, a um, what's it called? Um, an adapter for 10 volt and six, uh, sorry, 10 ampere and 16 ampere. And, and the guy just didn't understand, but is <laughs> using pictures and photos. That's how real their culture is. That's mm -hmm. how real 
the Uyghur experience is. Nobody's taking that away from them. So I'm no. showing people in this trip with our RV trailer caravan, as you like to specify, and we're pulling it with an electric vehicle, an electric car, no. a Chinese made electric car. So it presents a lot of challenges. And this is why we need to move slow. We can't just go from, okay, let's go from Aksu to Kashgar in one go. It's just never going to happen. It's 2,000 kilometers, not even in two days. It takes us several days and several stops because we're charging. And that gives us the possibility to go out and walk around and shoot. Oh, look at this market. Oh, look at these kids going to school. Oh, look at this. These kids playing football in the in, in, in a park. Just yeah. everyday yeah. life that a lot of people haven't actually seen and that contradict the narrative by a lot of these NGOs and NED sponsored authorities that now I'm going head on against them. And the moment you show them Eric Kinsey, the reality. Yes. He, in 2021, had an interview with uh, CJ Werleman saying like, if you go to Kashgar, if you go to Aksu, if you go to Hotan, you will not find Uyghurs. You will not find. I'm like, I posted it like, what are you talking about, sir? You're lying. <laughs> In those areas, that's all you can find. Immediate block on Twitter. So, yeah, so, that's just the thing I found. That as soon as you contradict them and say, well, do you really believe that? Because I've been to Xinjiang and this is what I saw. They don't come back and say you're a paid chill or you're a lie or anything like they just block. And and because I think what they don't want is that discussion happening inside their timeline. So anybody who has got some doubts can look in their timeline and say, well, hang on a second. Let me look at what this guy says, because there might mm -hmm. be something in this. And then all of a sudden, the doubts can become a different kind of doubt. They doubt that China is a, a great place. They doubt that China is a nice place. They assume that China is what these people say it is because it's all over the media. And then suddenly they see someone like you or I who have been here, met with locals, talked with locals, interacted with them, slept on their floors and, and done things like this that you know they welcome you into the area, which, of course, an oppressed group would not welcome you. They would be very wary of you and push you away. So when they do that, it tells you there's no oppression going on here. There's no persecution going on here. They're welcoming foreigners. They're welcoming strangers. And that doesn't happen when you're being oppressed. So when that happens, and we can show that and demonstrate that clearly through our actions, our videos, our, uh, and our, our, our pictures, then, of course, the people who are lying about it don't want that information in their timeline. So that's the reason I think that they block us. Um, I would like to, to take a moment to explain one of the reasons why I like to shoot, um, not shoot, sorry, my wife was complaining about that, don't say that, that doesn't sound good, to film, right? Children, children yeah. just going about their things. So natural, yeah. If you were worried about genocide, if you were worried about your kids being kidnapped, if you were worried about your kids being taken away from you and you being separated from your kid, if you were worried about that at all, would you let your children just walk on the street into the darkness? You know, it's dark at night and the kids are just playing here, playing there. This is why I film children just going about yeah. their playing and doing their things with their parents not even being around yeah it shows Would normality you, a parent do that if you were concerned worried scared no. of what might happen to my child no no you wouldn't so and that's that's, that's what we need. who travel through there can see now, that brings us to a point that uh, we can come back to Adrian Zenz's thing. One of, the, one of the points that we wanted to talk about was the distance. Now, mm -hmm. you know this through driving. I, I cycled through Xinjiang, and I, mostly through the, the northern or central part of Xinjiang. Um, and I, I was in Hami. I've cycled through. You probably entered through a place called Xinxin Sha rather than Hami itself. Uh, you entered through Sinsinsha, and Hami is another uh, 70 or 80 kilometers in, in, inside the, the, the region. Now, 
I've cycled through those regions and on a bike that's geared up to do about 20 to 25 kilometers an hour, you know, your average speed is 25. Then, you know, sometimes you go uphill and it's a bit slower. Then you go downhill and it's a lot faster. So you end up doing an average of 22 to 25 kilometers an hour. Now for us, it sometimes took three days to get from one town or city to the next town or city. And in between, the only place to stay is in the desert. There's nowhere else to stay. You're living under the road. Uh, every 180 kilometers or thereabouts, you find a service station. And we mm -hmm. found one that was closed. So we were in dire straits at one stage and truck drivers would give us water. You know, we get bottles of water from a truck driver. And, and that was how we had to, we, um, it, we were in no danger of death because there's, there's too many trucks going backwards and forwards that if worse came to the worst, we could just hail a truck and say, give us some water, please. And um, or can we buy some water? And, and the, what happens in those distances is that when you get to the other end of that long journey, sometimes what you're meeting there is this very small town. It has 20,000 people in it. By Chinese standards, that's a very small town. It has probably four or 500 kids maybe a couple of thousand kids, but they're all different ages. And so it will have a primary school and nothing else. It won't have a secondary school. The kids go off to the secondary school. And this is part of this coercion that people keep talking about. Why do the kids go? Why are the kids forced to go to a school? Now, I'm currently working in a school in Hernan for a Canadian company. They've sent me here to do some lectures. And I'm doing these lectures in this school and yesterday I walked into this massive school and, they, and I said, how many of your students are residual of uh, resident students and how many are um, uh, homegoers? And they said, oh, more than 90 percent stay in the school. This is in Hernan. This is a big city. Um, it's a city where they could go home if they choose to. They stay in the school dormitory. This is in the city. Imagine if your school, the nearest school, was 180 or 200 kilometers or 500 kilometers away. And these are the distances that we're talking. Your school could be further away than Belgium is from Paris. Right. So <laughs> Belgium is from Frankfurt. That's how far away your school might be. And it's a four or five hour drive across the desert to get there. You go there and you stay all term. That's what they do. If your school is more local, you may come home on Friday or Saturday and, and have the weekend at home. But more likely, if you're going to school in China and you're a senior high school student, you are more likely a resident in most places of China. Now, there are places like in Guangdong, I would say it's 50-50 or maybe even less, maybe 25, 75. In, in where I live in Zhongshan, most kids don't live in school, but a hell of a lot still do. But most don't. So a lot of the kids, I mean, it could be said that the kids don't have a choice. They have to go to these boarding schools, yeah. but there's actually a choice. And the government is choosing the best option for the children. Yeah. Let me let me explain. This is all related to poverty alleviation, and we're going to talk about that, because what Adrian Sense is trying to do is trying to vilify poverty alleviation right. and schooling. Although <clears throat> now he's talking about it's really important because when parents, when the kids are going to a boarding school, then the parents are free to go and work. Yes. It's that simple. So what is the choice in terms of education? You can build a hundred small schools and, 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 and try to make do with whatever resources you have to give them a certain education. Will the facilities be great? Will the teachers be of the highest quality? Will the materials, the food, the accommodation will be the best that they can have? Of course not, because you're spread thin into, into so many schools in so many small villages. Mm -hmm. Going to Kashgar, going from Kashgar to, to uh, the border uh, um, where we went, it, it takes four hours. It's 300 kilometers and, and there's just a few villages here and there. So what is the choice? Build a large school where all the kids can come with the same amount of money, the same amount of investment. You are creating a much better facility, which much better food, which much better curriculum, which much better teachers, much better food, much better Everything can be yes. much better because it's focusing one place. Mm -hmm. What is the trade-off? Okay, the kids have to come. 
So they provide buses that take them to their villages uh, on Friday afternoon and they bring them back on Sunday evening or Monday morning or whatever. But that's the choice. When people try to present it like they have no choice, yes, the choice was made to focus all the resources into one place so that these children can get the better education they can get. And as I said before, in doing so, these kids will become much more prepared than a lot of Westerners out there because they're learning Mandarin, they're learning math, science, all those good things, but they're also learning English. They're going to become the the future of China, as I said before. So... End of this parenthesis talking about education. Let's go back to labor, okay? Let me show you um, what uh, Adrian Sins is trying to do here. And and this is a very good example. He says, poverty alleviation group, uh, what are they doing? Okay, what are they doing in terms of, of poverty alleviation? He says, lazy persons, the list of lazy persons. So the Why? government... Why does he do this over lazy persons? He does this because it's his own interpretation of the Chinese language. Good. (laughs) He says, well, uh, there's a list, basically, um, of lazy persons, drunkards, and other persons with insufficient inner motivation. What do they have to do? They are subjected to repeated thought education. Again, we're going through interpretations here of what he understands from Chinese. But what does that sound to you like, uh, Jerry, when you, like when you hear it, thought education? I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but I, I do know a bit about education. And sometimes you have students who are not very good. Sometimes you have students who don't want to be very good, who are smart enough. And what do you do with them? You take them for counseling. Yeah. That's what that's what thought education is. What, what was it? Vicky Shu of ASPI wrote the word... Um, uh, thought dredging, I think, which was a, a student council. Sorry, not student. It was a, a human resource department, which they called. Uh, they had they had another name for that. And inside of the human resource department was a thought dredging department. And basically, they had interpreted the word counseling from the exact literal translation of Chinese. They're doing something which is called transliteration in linguistics. They, they're translating the words and interpreting their own meaning to those words. So, yeah, it's, a, it's what me, it is. Let me, let me continue with this idea of, of yeah. taking liberties with translation, but not only that, just inserting its own interpretation of things. He says, if this counseling <laughs> yeah, produced no obvious results, they were to be dealt with according to the document. We don't really know what this means. Yes, then he puts this opinion in there. Yeah, yeah, it sounds coercive. The context suggests that this is bad. So my opinion is the context is bad. That's my opinion. So therefore, I'm going to state it in a peer-reviewed paper. Somebody must have looked at that and said, sure, you know, you can't get away with it. Even people who hate China must look at this kind of thing and say, Adrian, you can't get away with this. You you yeah, gotta have you gotta have a unclear, reason. But it is and bad. you know what he would must be but bad. you know what he would do if if someone said you need a citation for to prove that this is bad, he would cite himself from 2021 <laughs> or 2020. <laughs> and that's how he proves it's bad. So this is his methodology, circular referencing himself. You know, he just he writes something as an opinion, it gets on the BBC, and then he circular references the BBC. And that's how these things perpetuate. And they want to perpetuate it like this. It, it is literally circular referencing. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I I've ask... got, if this failed to produce obvious results, that was that was the comment. If this thought education and, and he even put this in inverted commas, too. If this failed to produce obvious results, well, then they can go for uh, then they're dealt with according to the document, which sounds coercive to me. Maybe they they dealt with what does the document say? If the document says yeah. that they're, they're put into a prison, locked up, and thrown away the key, well, yeah, that's pretty coercive. If it says they go for further counseling at a, a place, that's not coercive. That may be uh, helpful to some people. And in fact, he mm. actually cites a guy who said this, yeah. he used the same words. I was lazy yes, let's, and let's, I was asking questions. Says, Go to that what one. What does yeah. the government do? 
they create they create a list. I mean, tell me how is this negative? You, the viewer, the person who doesn't like China, who 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 is on the fence on this, maybe how is this bad? The government created a list of people who have not realized a stable employment. And they Unemployed were people. exactly and they were organized. Uh, to be transferred into seasonal low, uh, seasonal labor, such as cotton picking. And this is the, again, this is down from his work, right? Page 16. This is a worker who is gone through the counseling and now is giving his testament, he, his testimony, sorry, about how it has changed him. Adrian Sense is putting things in his report and trying to make you think that this is bad. Let's read together, my friends. It says, in the past, my lazy thoughts of waiting, relying, and asking from the government were serious. I only knew how to ask for things from the party and the government. Now, I finally understand that the happiest thing is to use the money I can earn with my hardworking hands and my sweat in the future with the support of the party and the government policy, I will earn more money and make my family's life better every day. Why would Adrian Sense put this in his report? The negative. I don't Why? Know. How can you it's make very, this look bad? <laughs> it's a very good Anybody question. How, how do you make a guy who was unemployed, who is now employed and getting money and proudly stating I used to be lazy, but now I've realized how I can make money and spend my own money on things that I want to spend. And th there's a, one other really interesting point about this section that is worth mentioning, and that is that the, the Social government, Security. Yes, yes. The government well, are paying Social Security to people who are unemployed in this section. Adrian Zen says that. So they're, they're persecuting and genociding at the same time as providing a social security net, which seems a little bit untoward to me. Something's something's not right there. But Adrian says, says admits that they are providing a social security net. Now, some people are being told, here's a job. Go and take this job for the three months that it's going to be needed during the harvest season, or we'll take you off social security. That's coercion now. Of course, that's incentivizing if it happens in any other country. In Australia, they have a system called work for the dole. You go to a job, they send you, and you get paid whatever the rates are, but it may not be a permanent job. And if you're not working, you get the dole money, the, the social security. If you are working, you get your salary. And it's called work for the dole. They have this system. It still exists in Australia. So the, what are Australia doing? coercion. Now, I don't want to do, use this as whataboutism. I'm saying that this is not a coercive practice. This is a regular practice. When you have job opportunities in a place and you have able-bodied workers in another place, then you say, well, come to work here for three months. We'll pay you a salary. And if you don't, well, we're going to stop your social security. That's fair, I think. Yeah, now, I'm on the outside... Um... Go on. Even unemployment pay in, in countries like in America, in certain states, they only last for six months or something like that. Right. If you haven't gone to interviews, if you haven't taken jobs, they'll take them away from you. Mm. But in, in Xinjiang, that's negative. Now, we're going to draw, continue uh, talking about our experience and how this gives light to some of the things that Adrian Sense is trying to present as negative, as, as you said, is the the size of Xinjiang. Yes. So over here, he talks about um, that the people in Kashgar, right, they were picked up and they were accompanied by officials and work team cadres. Um, and these people would uh, bring them in a point-to-point -point transfer method to the places where they were going to be working. Now, this is this sounds... A little bit strange to people but as we mentioned before the distances in this in this region the distances in Xinjiang are enormous and the population density is so low yeah. that this has to be arranged so we'll pick you up in a bus 
and we'll do a, a half a day drive picking up people in different towns that have registered for these programs. And now we go to the place of employment where you will be having your meals and you'll have your 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 place of rest and whatnot. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how Adrian says is just trying to turn this into negatives. But then again, focus on this part. Point-to-point -point transfer, bad. No, sir. Point-to-point -point transfer is absolutely necessary in this region. Mm. Uh, Jerry, any, anything to add here? Well, uh, the quotation that I mentioned before, the, not the quotation, the, the statement I mentioned before about the size, uh, if you think about <clears> this, uh, it... Xinjiang is a third of Europe. It's as big as Germany and France combined. Now, if you try and imagine driving across France in a day, then you've got the kind of uh, southern Xinjiang would, would be that. And these cotton fields are massive. They're, they're huge. And most of the cotton is, is me mechanized now. And, and we know this for a fact because even John Deere, the largest uh, agricultural machinery company in the world has opened up a factory in China to service the needs of this kind <laughs> of region. So when you think about this, are John Deere being sanctioned by the American government for selling machines to pick cotton in Xinjiang? Of course, they're not, because why would you, if, if you're selling machines, every machine is 10 or 20 or 30 less people that you need. But there is one other thing. Um, and it's I've got a, a quotation here uh, that let me just find it. Uh, it was um, about, yes, his, his statement, given that cotton picking as an economic sector has historically been associated with exploitation this is why he believes that Xinjiang is being exploited. Given that cotton picking as an economic sector has historically been associated with exploitation, that's the purpose of this paper. Now, I call this projection. Who picks cotton? And over the historical context, where was most cotton picked in the developed world and who picked it? Now, this is a whataboutism for sure, but this is a pure projection on the part this of someone living from. in America who knows for a fact that most cotton in America for a hundred years, for 200 years, was picked by slaves. And then after it was picked by slaves, was picked by indentured workers. And currently, most hand picked cotton. Now, there are two different types of cotton there's the short staple and the long staple. And long staple is better picked by hand because it's a softer and machine can, can harm it. Who picks most of that today in America? Prisoners, exploited <laughs> prisoners who are getting 12 cents an hour for doing it. Now, what he's saying is, if we're doing it in America, they must be doing it in China. And that's really mm. this, the, the whole basis of this entire paper, I think. China but must be doing it because we do it. Be before we get into the uh, mechanization of cotton picking, which is another section, another we'll talk another yeah. five minutes about that. I, I, I need you to ponder, I need you to think, and I need you to use your logic and understand that what Adrian Sense is trying to do is just vilify poverty alleviation. Mm -hmm. Listen mm -hmm. to what he publishes in his paper. This is his paper, and he has no other choice but to put it there and somehow try to twist it into something negative. These accounts indicate that Xinjiang employment policies come with material benefits. There's centralized assistance. They're designed to protect laborers from exploitation, improve work conditions, improve safety standards, increase awareness of their rights, and propagate social benefit coverage. I mean, people, he's telling you that China is doing a great thing, a good thing for the people. However, this is bad. Who did he cite to say that? A Chinese media ah. group. 
Very yeah. good. He signs. You citing a Chinese, Chinese media, media group. Now I, I'm going to make. I'm going to throw out a challenge here. I'm going to throw out a challenge to your your viewers and and my viewers and say, can you please, not by citing media or Adrian Zenz, but can you please find a point where any Chinese media group or outlet, any publication, any uh, TV, any find a place where Chinese media has told a lie and tell me about it because. I've been looking at this. For, I mean, I, I've been in China for nearly 20 years. I've been looking at this for the last three years, and I mean really in-depth looking at it. I, I analyze to the nth degree, and sometimes I overanalyze things, but I can't find Chinese media telling a lie. So here's a challenge to your viewers. Please find a lie and tell me about it, because that was Chinese media telling Adrian Zenz that this is a good thing for poverty alleviation. It's a good thing for the people. It's a good thing for the government. It's good for the community. It's good for the country. There are no negatives about this. The only negative might be a touch of homesickness if somebody has to move away for two years. Of course, that's not, not a nice thing. But that is a very, very standard thing that people do in China. And don't forget, Chinese people are long-term focused. So when they move away for two years, they know they're going back home two years or three years later, and they're going to buy a house or an apartment, which they couldn't do if they'd stayed at home. Something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There, there's something else that uh, we're going to talk about here. We're going to start talking about mechanization and, and the effect that it has on, on people. Okay. So a little bit of, of, of reference here. The northern part of Xinjiang is more suitable for mechanized speaking of cotton. The southern one, not so much. Um, because of the desert and because of the distances and whatnot. But let's talk about what he is saying about the mechanization of cotton picking. He says, increased mechanization does not necessarily reduce the risk of forced labor. Any evidence? No. But let's look at what he describes and see how he is wrong. To promote mechanization, the state aggressively promotes land transfer schemes. So basically they say to the farmer, the little farmer, hey, let us use your land uh, to plant yeah. cotton and we can use machines uh, because this is more plots. They're not big enough to, to, to put the machines in there. So they go to the village and say, okay, we would like to take your 20, 30, 40 plots of land and unify them so that we can use our machines and produce more. And what do we do in exchange? <laughs> we will pay you money. <laughs> we will give you money if you, if you let us use the land. The land is still yours, but we're going to use it and we'll pay you money. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> these uh, large scale operators give these farmers money. They don't have to do anything and they will get money. Now, what does Adrian sense mm -hmm. here? Does this place Uyghur farmers? this place so no they're still living there and getting money without doing the work are often coercively transferred into labor intensive manufacturing work again any evidence that this is coercive any evidence that that they actually go and work they could just stay at home and be some of those lazy people that he a lot, described a lot depends on their age as well because remember 60 is the retirement age in china if they're 58 59 they're probably just going to retire if they're younger mm -hmm. than that, then what are you going to do? You're going to sit at home and collect your income, which probably isn't that great, but it'll be enough to live on. And it's also 70 years of income. You get If they use your land, they use your land only for 70 years. So you and your family for the next 70 years get payment for that land. After that, the land reverts back to you or you continue the arrangement or your family continues in, the arrangement. In his attempt to, to vilify... Mm -hmm this this new scheme which is let's let's improve the the productivity of the land by unifying these several plots from different farmers he goes on to say and he's forced to say that these usage right transfers can theoretically be reversed because the land still belongs to them right to to the farmers it makes it clear that transfers from an integral part of a long-term strategy so these farmers are going to receive money 
for a very long time. They can reverse it anytime they want, but they will continue to receive this money. And and uh, now I want to bring you guys back to um, the uh, first part, the part that was in green, where he was saying, like, look, the, the concept of this um, uh, adverse incorporation uses the vulnerabilities and short-term needs of the poor to create exploitative labor relationships. There's this it could, mechanization it could be interpreted as short term. He's saying it a few pages down that this particular scheme of mechanization is actually long term. It can be reversed any time, but yeah. they will continue to <clears throat> double dip, as I'd like to call it, for a very long time. What do I mean by double dip? They're getting income from the land Impressive and income, then yeah. if they wish to. They can go and pick cotton somewhere else and get double the pay. Or work in one of the factories that produces products from the cotton. Um, there's, exactly. there's one other aspect to this, to, to that point, and, and it's a valid point. It could be interpreted that these poor farmers are being offered an incentive to give up their land. I get that. It could be interpreted as such. Anybody with a negative opinion of China would, would quite clearly say they're being forced to do that. And I get that. Now, how can we refute that? The only way to refute that is by a field study. You go to that farmer and say, were you coerced to do that? And he'd probably say, no, hell no. I was able to buy a car and an apartment in the city, which I couldn't have done before. That's the difference. No one has ever asked anyone in Xinjiang what their thoughts are. The only people they've asked are people who used to be in Xinjiang and have now left for whatever reason, but they have now left. They've left with their passports and their visas and all the usual things that these non-refugees, these uh, so-called witnesses who give testimonies that are unsworn and say that terrible things are happening in Xinjiang are not in Xinjiang. Nobody is in Xinjiang asking these questions. Now, there are a couple of people who are planning to do this, and I have great faith in Jack James, who is in China now and wants to go to Xinjiang. Uh, she's uh, she's struggling to get the proper approvals, but she wants to go to Xinjiang and do this. Maureen Hubel is Maureen. going to do this, Maureen. Now, um, again, with Maureen, I'm, one of the things that's happening, and I need to talk to Maureen about this. If you're watching Maureen, let's have a conversation. Um, is that Chinese media are now making her the darling of Chinese media. And there's a danger there that whatever she produces, no matter how credible it is, is going to be written off as stage-managed Chinese media. That's a problem. Jack James is going the opposite way. She is completely independent of any Chinese media, any Chinese institution, and that's causing her difficulty. She's not being able to get into... She can go to Xinjiang, no problem at all. But if she wants to put adverts in local papers and posters around the street to, to say, I'm doing field research on this situation, she's going to get into trouble with the local government. She needs authority mm -hmm. and permission. And there's the dilemma of anyone studying China, because China does have control over what people do. There is no doubt about that. And it's done for positive reasons, but there are some negative connotations to it. Anybody who wants to go to Xinjiang to ask questions is gonna be tarred with the BBC CNN brush. That's the problem. Without having the proper authority, and that's another problem, because the moment you get the proper authority, the Western media will say this is a staged, managed, <clears throat> uh, useless piece of research. It's no good because Chinese media or Chinese government allowed it to happen and they only let you talk to uh, this. We know this is not true. And we know this from people like Daniel Dumbrell and Sean Rain, who have traveled through places in Tibet and talked to anybody they wanted to talk to. And they've come away and said, I talked to anybody. I, I was with CGTN or I was with Xinhua. I talked to anybody. I just said, let's stop here. I want to go into that building. And they will go into that building and talk to people. Now, that's it's, proving it's to one me. Of the reasons why, talking about what Maureen wants to do, I actually offered to, to be her videographer. I can just follow her and, and document and video whatever right. research she does when she comes here next year, whenever that is. But you're, you're right about that. I mean, when you associate yourself with state media to come and, and, and cover Xinjiang, there's automatically a label that goes into whatever you're producing. This is why it's so important for me to come here as a self-funded person. So let yeah. me make it very clear to any of you people with understanding challenges that you need thought education. You, 
<laughs> they need full <laughs> education. That what I am doing right here is absolutely self-funded. It mm. is self-funded. Nobody, and 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 I run into into some of those challenges. I don't do interviews with people. First of all, my Chinese is not that good. Number two, <clears throat> their Chinese is not that good. Number three, I don't want to. I don't want to get into things that might might cause me any trouble. Do you know what I mean? I do. There's nothing wrong taking place, but what I do is I just turn on my phone. And just show you, look what's happening. Does this look like genocide? Does this look like the parents are worried about their children being kidnapped? Yeah, right. Does this look like, does this look like a, uh, like that short video of the young girls just blasting the music in their car? I was like, yeah. this is so great because these are people expressing themselves. It was Uyghur music that they were blasting. I was just and about it, to say, what kind of music was it? That. Yes. I, I, saw I remember it. doing that uh, yeah. when I was a kid, so I could relate to that. They do that in Xinjiang too. I mean, yeah. that's but that's what they? I do. That's yeah. what I. Every try to time show. anyone goes to Xinjiang or any time, and and here's the thing: people say, "Why are they using white faces to tell the story of Xinjiang?" Because I go on CGTN or something like that. The reason they're using white faces is because they know they know. The moment they put a, a, a Uyghur in that position, then everybody in the world is going to say, oh, he was made to say that, he was coerced to say that, or she was coerced. All these, uh, the ghoulie sisters and things like that. Yeah, they're using agencies. Why aren't they using agencies? Of course, anybody who wants to make it on social media is going to do wow. things like that. They're going to need management, proper management. You can't, I mean, I know for a fact I'm trying to build a social media presence and it's really, really full-time job. And you can't be a social media commentator at the same time as you're marketing yourself as a social media commentator. They're two different jobs. So you, you need agency. Now, I don't have agency. No one pays me to go on CGTN. And anybody who suggests that is just telling a lie. Now, I can say that and I've got a, I've got a stock standard response to it. You're the same. I went to, to Xinjiang by bike first time with absolutely no funding whatsoever. Now, the second time I went, because I was already proven to have ra raised a shitload of money for, uh, for charity, the second time I went, I had a couple of corporations who provided me fund, private corporations. One was a British company. They paid for our bikes, and um, we paid for our accommodation. We paid for our transportation. We paid for, in fact, we paid for everything. But the, this company bought three very good bikes for us to travel on. And, and we had the bikes built. It cost 45,000 RMB. And my friend Gordon Stiles, who, thank you, Gordon, if you're watching, um, he paid for those bikes. And we put his company logo on the, uh, the crossbar. And uh, we wore a shirt which had his logo there. And we had our charity, uh, uh, what do they call it, the, uh, the three-dimensional barcode, the QR code. On, on the arm mm. so people could scan this and make a donation if they wanted to. So that was all for charity. That was the purpose of that. The second one was better organized. The first one was just me getting on a bike and riding. People say, well, how can you go to Xinjiang? I got on my bike and I rode in, the same as you got in your car and drove in. Yeah. No one stopped you. Yeah. I guess when you got into Xinjiang, you had to go through a security check. We had to, every city you go into, there's a security check. It's it's part of a video that uh, that uh, that I'm going to make of that I want to make is how we are doing what we're doing to make those security checks easy. The, there's a very short video that I made about the changes. Look, security yeah. checks are way way less than when I came here in 2021. Way okay. less on a 60 kilometer drive. We were we were asked to get out of the car and register in 2021. Five or six times. Today, we just drive hundreds of kilometers, and the only thing that happens is when you exit a highway, you need to present your, your passport, yeah. and they input it into, into their system, and that's it. One of the yeah. things that we have done, because that could be tedious, right? It could take a long time, is we we made copies of all our documents from, from my work uh, permit, to my visa, my last entry to China, my passport, yeah. our driver's licenses, absolutely everything. It's, it's a three-page little document, and we made many copies of that. And whenever we get to one of these very few police checks, we're like, hey, keep that. You can write whatever you need later. Just confirm that is the original, yeah. 
and that's it. Yeah. We have had stops that are three minutes. Yeah. When before and, and, and the local three. people with their face scan and their ID card go through in seconds. Bang, bang. There, you know, a thousand people can pass through there in the time it takes for them. But you know what they did with us? In every single place that we stopped in, they were just curious. I mean, my wife is Chinese, and there was two Australian guys and a Chinese lady cycling across. I mean, that's crazy. And then what are you doing? You know, what the hell is this? Oh, we're raising money for charity. We showed them this, and we've got logos all over us. We're like uh, Formula One racing drivers. And... Uh, and they said, that's amazing. Oh, here's some water. You know, would you like? And there's a bowl of fruit would come along. We're, we're going to take a couple of minutes because there's two of us. They had to manually enter the, the information. So it was fantastic. They were so helpful. Can we have a photograph with you? Oh, yeah, sure. And got photographs of, of people in these checkpoints doing this. It was a quite amazing thing. Uh, and it, and it, there was no theory. problem. But it was, I, I, I did view it as kind of, not oppressive. That's not the right word. Um, I, I, it's a pain in the butt is probably a better way to say it. Because when you're cycling and you've got 120 kilometers to go and you have to stop three times for 20 minutes each time, then you're adding an extra hour to your day. And that is a problem. And uh, there was mm -hmm. one occasion where we ended up sleeping 30 kilometers short of our destination because we were just it was early in the in the place. And, and it ended up I was talking to Nathan Russo, satellite boy. It appears that I was hundreds of meters from the largest camp in Xinjiang, camping in the desert. And you know, I've shown him exactly on a map where I was. And he said, well, you must have seen this. It's Dabachang, which is a, a, a small city outside of Turpan, uh, and, or outside of Xinjiang, actually, uh, outside of Urumqi, sorry. And um, it's got the largest, apparently, camp. And it's right by the side of the road. So we camped 100 meters off the road. We actually camped in a cemetery because it was quiet. Do you think they let you quiet. camp 100 no meters from us. a camp? No one <laughs> stopped us. And, and then 30 kilometers later, the next morning, we got up and we cycled into Daba Chan and we went through the security. And no one said, where were you last night? No one asked. What pictures did you take? No one asked. No one cared. Mm. And there we were, according to Satellite Boy, we were literally hundreds of meters from the largest camp. We heard nothing. It, it was near a train line. We heard trains going past all night, but we never saw a camp. Um, I didn't see any prisons or camps. I'm not suggesting there aren't any. I just never saw one. Now, was Why I blind? There be? <laughs> well, every, it's, there's 11 million people live there. And, and they've, you know, Australia's got 25, 26 million people. It's got 145 prisons. Of course, Xinjiang's course got prisons. Of course, prisons. Yeah. <laughs> and, they, and they show pictures of a prison and say, oh, look, there's a prison in Xinjiang. Yeah, of course, there's prisons in Xinjiang. Are you stupid? Why wouldn't well, there be? <laughs> why wouldn't there be prisons in Xinjiang? There's prisons in Brisbane. I've been in them. There's prisons in uh, Sydney and Melbourne. I've been in them. I've been in prisons in London, Brixton, and Holloway. Holloway's an odd one. Uh, the, the women's prison in Holloway, when, when you go in there as a male, wow, they're all hanging out the window screaming at you. And I was, I was young right. and handsome in those days. Let's, uh, let's get on to, on to the conclusion of uh, Adrian Sands, right? He yeah. basically, as we've proven uh, through this video, trying to do a couple of things. Number one, trying to redefine what an ILO violation is. And what mm -hmm. he's trying to do is he's trying to include labor transfers into yeah. an ILO violation. Uh, he's not concerned with proving the coerciveness uh, into these labor transfers. He's just saying labor transfers, that's coercive. That's that's mm -hmm. that's an I that should be an ILO violation. That's the purpose of this um the, of this paper and how does he do that he's trying to present poverty alleviation in a negative light and as we showed you there's all kinds of good things in poverty alleviation from from the investment in the infrastructure to the actual effort to give people employment uh, as yep. he himself put in his book 
just defending their rights, making sure that there are no abuses, uh, picking up door to door, uh, creating schools so that the kids can go and be safe and learn and have a better future and be the, the, the next generation of Xinjiang um, super, super star executives and workers and whatnot. But he's trying to paint that as a negative. Now, this word that he used uh, initially, this is structurally coercive environments. In the conclusion, yeah, he cites somebody else as saying that they, uh, these um, are conceptualized as formal and degrees of unfreedom, where clear cut distinctions between voluntariness and involuntariness are inapplicable. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like we don't know. It know. It sounds like know he doesn't have a clue. They could be doing something. Voluntary uh, joining of these programs actually takes place. And that reminds us of what we talked about with Brian uh, in yeah. the last, in the 2020 edition of this. So he's building up on things that he cannot confirm once again. And if he that, wanted to confirm it, there is a very, very easy way to confirm it. And that's to ask people. But no. So, and, and of course, they, 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 they say it's impossible to go to Xinjiang and ask people. Well, you're in Xinjiang and you can ask people if you want to. I'm in, mm -hmm. I've been to Xinjiang several times. I'm not there now. But I know several Uyghurs in, in my hometown in Zhongshan, which is now my hometown, there are several Uyghur restaurants. They're all over China. Every city you go to has Uyghur restaurants. Uh, now, the simple answer is fieldwork. If you don't do fieldwork, you can't prove your point. Now, he could quite easily prove his point by coming to China and asking people or having somebody in China asking people. And here's the other thing. He could get on the telephone and he could phone the Islamic Association of Xinjiang. I'm sure it's in the book. He could find that telephone number. He is an, he's an online researcher. He's a data miner. He's an expert, apparently, at finding things in China. Surely a man with those skills, with a PhD in this kind of field, can pick up the phone and talk to the people that he's talking about in his papers. Now, if they say, I'm not prepared to talk to you, he could use that as I talked to and they weren't prepared to talk to me. Now we have a little bit more circumstantial evidence. But right now, all we've got is a load of allegations without anything to support them. Now, before we finish, can I read a quote from him or from his paper? Uh, it says, yep. over, I haven't got a copy of the quote. Uh, I've got, I've got it on my computer. I should have sent it to you before. I'm going to read this anyway. Over 90% of illegal religious activities take place in rural areas. Over 90% of all violent terrorists live in rural areas. The reasons why rural areas account for such large proportions are inseparable from poverty. Some people have nothing to do for a long time, no jobs to work, they idle about and they make trouble out of nothing. They are easily instigated and seduced into wrongdoing by the three evil forces. That's separatism, extremism and terrorism. If we do a good job in the work of relieving poverty and guiding people of all ethnic groups to live a modern and civilized life, it will be a powerful hedge against religious extremism. That is a quotation from 2017 the Kashgar Party Office Bulletin, page six. And it's actually cited by Adrian Zenz as being part of his definition of coercion. If we do a good job in the work of alleviating deep poverty and guide people of all ethnic groups to live a modern and civilized life, it will be a powerful hedge against religious extremism. Wow. That's what the Chinese government in Kashgar, the Chinese Communist Party, the CPC, actually said in 2017, that's their goal. What's Adrian Zenz's that's what goal? what they want to do. <clears throat> mm. But before we go, just a couple yeah. of minutes, I want to show you the one person that he quotes in his oh, uh, text, right? In his yeah. text, he says, oh, there have been millions of people that have been 
uh, mobilized uh, around uh, Xinjiang to work. But he is going to quote this person. He quotes a person who participated in the Uyghur Tribunal. If you guys don't know the Uyghur Tribunal, it sounds like a legal entity, but it's not. It's just an LLC that was uh, established in, in the UK. And uh, they have people like Mr. Nice, right, uh, the QC. But it, there's no need to swear your testimony. There's there's no legal validity. They even try no to get uh, a no cross-examination. So she says, my name is Miriam Sultan. I live in Turkey studying for my master's degree in Ankara. I moved to Turkey in 2010. As a result, my mother was taken to a concentration camp. So um, here's one of the things. She moved in 2010 to Turkey, and because of that, her mother was taken to a camp. She says later on yeah, that her mother is 55 years old. We assume that means right now. So she went to camp when she was 43 years old. She retired, as she continues to say here, in 2004 at the age of 37. So her mother retired very, very early. But this is the thing that I want to focus on uh, and make you wonder. She says, number two, in 2018, I heard that my mother was actually arrested in September 2017. The reporters from Radio Free Asia clarified the news. Do we need to tell our viewers who Radio Free Asia is? Radio CIA Free Asia voice. is the CIA. So basically, the CIA informed her radio, via Radio Free Asia that her mother had been arrested. That's interesting. Even after... All these horrible things happened to her mom. She says she has only been able to see her three times, right? She has only Christ. been able to see her mom three times. But here's the other thing that is very interesting. She was taken to a camp or she was under house arrest. I am not sure which. However, oh. she has seen her three times. So she didn't ask her. Remember, this testimony is from 2022. Sorry, 2021. <clears throat> Right. Can I just uh, ask the, the question? If the reason that her mother was arrested was because she went to Turkey, how did she get to see her mother three times? If her crime was your daughter went to Turkey, then surely the daughter's crime. Okay, now in an authoritarian state, maybe they'll arrest the mother to bring the daughter back. But now she says, I've seen her three times. So, in other words, she lives in Turkey now. She's been back to visit Xinjiang three times, or maybe she came back once and visited three times in that period, I'm not sure. But the fact is, she's been back to Xinjiang, and now she's back in Turkey, but better, she's the better, one who... Better, better, better than that, better than that, Jerry, better than that. Hold on one second. Okay. So, she has seen her mother three times, but she forgot to ask her if she was taken to a camp or she was under house arrest. Take a look at number three, right, right here. <laughs> so she talked to her, but she doesn't really know. This is her testimony. But She's the best like part of this, years. the best part of this is that in 2021, and I don't have this right here because I didn't print screen it, but it's an Adrian Census report. She went back to university in Beijing. Yeah, to do a master's Not degree. Not only did she come to visit her mom, but she registered at a university in Beijing in 2021. This is Miriam Sultan. This is who Adrian Sense is quoting as, as, as a witness to this labor, uh, forced labor uh, of children in school. And the, the interesting when thing is... Somebody telling you things, when you find somebody telling you things that are so... What? You need to question everything else. Yes, you need and to the other thing is that the, the interview with, with that lady was interviewed by Adrian Zenz's team and cited in the citations as being interviewed by Adrian Zenz's team. And it's uh, basically what they're saying is we gave her loaded questions. We, 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 we've edited what we want out of it. Now, how on earth did she come back to Xinjiang to visit her mother three times if she was the person who committed the crime? 
how on earth did she register for a master's degree in a Beijing university? And how on earth was she allowed to return to Turkey where she now lives so she can give evidence against China, uh, unsworn evidence against China? Uh, it so just people, makes people just just think think a little bit and understand that a lot of the things that you're being fed up just don't add up. And people accuse us of being shields for just asking questions when all we're trying to do is say like, hey, look at everything the governments are doing against China, against Xinjiang, when when there's just no footing, there's just no no, no substance to, to the allegations. This person, her witness, her testimony doesn't add up. It doesn't add up. It's, it's oh, I don't know if she went to a camp or she, she was in house arrest, but I saw her three times. I never cared to ask. And then she went to prison because I went to Turkey, but I came back to study in Beijing. Come on, man. Come on. Yeah. Was she under house <laughs> arrest or did she go to a concentration yeah. camp? Yeah. There, there was the other one um, <laughs> that Daniel Dumbrell exposed who had given evidence uh, to, to a Senate hearing committee that she was she witnessed, but she was never a victim of torture or anything. And then later on, she was uh, she witnessed uh, rapes and other things. And then later on, she was abused and tortured herself. So three different times she gave evidence and the evidence changed. Now, I saw a very interesting article the other day uh, from the World Uyghur Congress, which said, please stop messing about, basically, I'm paraphrasing here, stop messing about with, with our uh, appeals. They're going to court because the Uyghurs in Washington are not getting their green cards. They're not getting their citizenship. They're not getting what they want. And of course, they can't get what they want because the moment they do, they cease to be useful to the people who want them to do so. Now, I'm not saying that the whole of the American system is corrupt, but I'm just saying there appears to be some corruption in there. And that means why Adrian Zenz is another one. He doesn't have the green card. He doesn't have citizenship of the United States. He works there on a working visa or working permit. And he was he's unlikely to get it because he's still useful. He is the person that when this all falls over, inevitably it will, they can point okay. at him and say, yeah, there's the guy. He, he misled us. We, we believed him because he did such good research. He lied about his research. Well, we're not saying he's lying about his research. I'm saying he truly believes what he says, but he's presenting it in a way that does not prove that what he says is correct. Uh, he, and he, I do believe that Adrian Zenz believes what he says because God has sent him on this message. He's on, on this sure. uh, task. Yeah, God is God has given him this task to do it. So everything he reads that's positive about China is interpreted as being they would say that, wouldn't they? And everything he reads that's negative, well, it must be true because it's negative about China and they're an evil, an evil country. That's his view of life. Yeah. All right, friends. Um, yeah. Well, that's that's all we wanted to present to you. Um, this circular references of Adrian Sense and this conclusions that all he's trying to do is present poverty alleviation as an ILO violation, and he wants to redefine ILO so that fits the narrative, and then more sanctions can be imposed into China. Um, that's uh, that's our show for today, Jerry. Thank you so much for taking time. Out oh, of your thanks for inviting me. Really enjoyed <laughs> talking to you. I'm very jealous of you at the moment. I wish I was where you are. I'm in Luoyang, but I'm working, working, working. So, yeah, I'm really jealous of you. <laughs> All right. And with, yeah. with your permission, I'm going to show this very quickly to the people who want to uh, support the work that we do here at the Wu Mao Show. Uh, if you can buy us a cup of coffee, you can use this QR code here in China. Um, but links to, to our channels and to all the different things that we do will be in the description of this video. Guys, that's all for today. Thank you so much. And uh, until we see you again, take it easy and bye for now. Bye, everyone.